video, industry and business are far better resourced to independently consult with the government as proponents of development. And there's historically been a consultation in balance. Under the new regime, business and industry will obviously have a second bite at the cherry at the DA stage as proponents who want to push the envelope and seek local variations when the community will no longer have a say in most cases. Just to expand on how restricted community <coughs> rights may be once plans are in place, we note that open standing provisions to bring civil enforcement have been nominally retained in the bill. The Minister just last week referred to these rights as iconic in a media release. However, contrary to the expressed intention of the white paper, open standing could be seriously undermined by provisions in the draft legislation. Part 10 of the bill appears to severely curtail the public's ability to challenge legal errors of decision makers in the Land and Environment Court in fundamental areas such as community participation, strategic plans and state significant development approvals. EDO is currently seeking further legal advice on this critical issue because it will have significant implications for communities who wish to protect their local environments. The imbalance of review and appeal rights and participation between the community members will continue to limit community confidence in the system. There's further specific detail on reviewed rights in our briefing note that's on the web as well. Can we have some copies at the back? I'll now give a bit of an overview on strategic planning, the key issues and concerns we have on that front. The White Paper proposes 10 principles to inform strategic planning outcome, outcomes and processes. These are in the draft legislation in part three. So several principles deal with good governance measures, such as agency, cooperation, infrastru infrastructure integration, early communication, community participation, monitoring and reporting of outcomes. However, many are economically focused. So just to take the first principle, for example, strategic plans should promote the state's economy and productivity through facilitating housing, retail, commercial and industrial development and other forms of economic activity having regard to environmental and social considerations. Following Nari's earlier comments on the objects, this principle absolutely does not equal ecologically sustainable development. Environmental and social considerations are very much an afterthought here. Just as a little trivial aside, this principle is so heavily front-loaded with economic considerations that if I tried to tweet it, I would run out of characters somewhere around economic activity that means having regard to social and environmental considerations doesn't even come within the attention span of a tweet. Anyway, the proposed strategic planning principles do not deal with environmental <coughs> issues. For example, there's no reference to improving or maintaining environmental outcomes, assessing cumulative impacts or climate change responses. There's an additional financial viability test. There's a foil against onerous planning controls enshrined in Principle 10 with no equivalent tests for environmental or social viability. Our concern is these unbalanced principles will influence unbalanced strategic planning. In terms of the actual plans proposed, the White Paper and the Planning Bill provide further detail on the four-level hierarchy of instruments. Each type of plan will have a minimum public exhibition period, for example, 28 days, a common structure and must be consistent with those plans above it. So briefly, 8 to 12 New South Wales planning policies, so this is the state level, will be developed for key policy areas and these are to be done in time for the planning, by the time the planning laws are introduced to Parliament. These are to set out objectives and direction to guide land use. They're endorsed through Cabinet and made by the Planning Minister. They are to be certified as consistent with the new Act's objectives and principles and they're to give effect to the strategic aims of current SEPs, state environmental planning policies, strategic regional land use plans, and section 117 directions. These are to be implemented by the lower level plans. Regional growth plans, the next level down, will outline strategic objectives, policies, and actions for regional planning over the next 20 year period. These will apply to all areas of New South Wales. They'll deal with vision, spatial planning, housing, employment, environment and natural resources, infrastructure, sub-regional outcomes and monitoring and reporting. It's intended that they incorporate relevant aspects of existing regional plans and strategies. They'll be led by a 
planning department and a new CEO's group, and they will involve significant community, state agency, and local council collaboration. The next level down, sub-regional delivery plans. These will provide the delivery framework for regional growth plans. So these will be the plans that identify and rezone precincts and areas of state or sub-regional significance. They'll set development parameters and building envelopes in nominated sub-regions. They'll integrate infrastructure and land use planning via the growth infrastructure plans. These will be prepared by sub-regional planning boards, but they'll be endorsed by the whole of government and made by the minister with advice from these boards. They will also, they're intended to include strong community participation, and they are to be completed within two years of the new legislation commencing. They're to be underpinned by evidence from sectoral strategies and tested with respect to their economic viability. Again, a new economic viability test. Finally, at the local level, local plans will replace current LEPs. These will be the main legal document that will deliver the strategic plan, the strategic vision for a local government area. So each local plan will include four parts, strategy, planning, controls, development guides and contributions. They'll set out zoning and visual planning controls based on fewer zones. I think currently there are about 36 zones. These will be conflated to 13 broader zones. They'll set out development guides with more detailed standards to address impacts and intensity. So when I've referred to building envelopes before, this is a new concept that will replace the current new numerical standards, for example, regarding to height, floor space ratio and so forth. The local plans will guide development, facilitate the majority of development to be assessed according to codes, and there'll be some assessment on merit where development does not meet the codes. Nari will talk about this further in a moment. So in terms of the potential strengths and benefits, if done properly, strategic planning can have significant benefits for local communities and the environment. It can identify corridors for biodiversity or for public transport. It can factor in cumulative impacts. It can identify sensitive areas and appropriate growth areas. It can help build resilience in the landscape, landscape by planning for climate change adaptation. And importantly, it can reduce land use conflicts at the development assessment stage. The white paper focus on evidence-based strategic planning with upfront community engagement in order to create a hierarchy of strategically linked, co consistent and coherent plans is therefore a potential strength of the new system if it is done properly. In terms of our concerns with the proposed strategic planning regime, our specific concerns in relation to each new type of plan are detailed in our briefing paper. I won't read the list now, I'll just note some examples. The white paper includes no concrete detail